Our next athlete, Hugh Herr, was, like me, struck down as a teenager. I have known Hugh for 10 years, and I have always been impressed with his incredible climbing accomplishments and his brains. Once again for this show, I did something I've never done before, climbed a sheer rock wall. I did it with one leg, following a guy with no legs. Who says we can't? This is the story of Hugh Herr. Hugh Herr runs a lab at MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He is making bionic legs. What we'll see in this century is more and more advanced human machine systems, human machine interaction, better and better technology will eliminate disability and from that stepping stone will actually go beyond and extend human capability. Before MIT, Hugh Herr was known around the world for his rock climbing prowess. Well, upper force is fine. So if you pull now, it's an upward force. He started climbing with his brothers as a teenager in Pennsylvania. We actually saw a climber on, on television and we were inspired and went out and purchased gear and how-to manuals. There were five brothers and sisters. Ellen was seven years older than Hugh. My oldest brother started the climbing bit, but then Hugh, oh, I, I'm guessing he was six or seven. I mean, he's really young, and he just took off. Hugh became a climbing prodigy. Then, in January of 1982, at the age of 17, he and a friend decided to ice climb up the sheer face of Huntington's Ravine on New Hampshire's Mount Washington. As we went, the conditions got worse and worse. Um, very, very high winds. We were bar barely able to stand. Um, intense blizzard snowfall. So we accidentally descended into what's called the Great Gulf uh, region. It's the wilderness side of Mount Washington. We survived by building uh, snow caves and uh, hugging, hugging each other to, to stay warm. I don't remember who called me, probably it was my mother. Hugh's missing. I went out in the woods and I just was like, Hugh, hang in there, hang in there. Could you tell your feet were getting too cold? Well, our feet quickly became numb, so that's, that's not a good thing. And when you're hypothermic, you, one cannot think clearly. So even though we were approaching four days, we thought it, we were still in the same 24-hour day. A search and rescue effort was underway, but they did not anticipate how quickly the boys had climbed. We made it within a few miles of a roadway, and at that point, we were no longer able to walk. We just gave up all hope, and we, we actually stopped hugging each other to stay warm. We just reasoned the sooner we die, the better. A person with snowshoes came up across human footprints. She heard about the rescuer and decided to follow the prints, and sure enough, they led to our snow cave. And then we were plucked from the mountain via a helicopter. Just as I was walking in the door, my sister comes out and she was all excited. They found him, they found him, they found him. At the hospital, Hugh found out that one of the volunteer rescuers had been killed in an avalanche while trying to find him. I remember, I was like, oh, I, I don't know how Hugh is gonna take this. and. He didn't, you know, to this day, I know it really upsets him. That information along with, you know, the, the whole trauma of the, of the ordeal was, was uh, you know, very, very difficult to deal with. That was the number one thing that got him to be so passionate about making a difference. Did they have to amputate your legs quickly? We were in the hospital several months uh, before our limbs were amputated. His doctor in the hospital told him, you're probably, you're never gonna rock climb again. It was almost like the guy said, I bet you can't. <laughs> <laughs> That's about what he said, you know. Doctors aren't gonna tell you you're gonna have amputations and then go out and rock climb. Hugh returned home and set up a workshop in the garage. He had gone to vocational high school and knew how to make things. He began to experiment with climbing prostheses. So I went and I realized the foot need not look like a foot. I can cut off the heel because it's less weight. I don't need my heel. I can optimize angles and stiffnesses. I can change my height. Given that I'm so lucky that both my legs are amputated, I can be as short as five feet or as tall as I'd like. Hugh says that within one year of climbing with his new legs, he was better than ever. My climbing colleagues first labeled me as courageous, which is always very demeaning. 
you're so courageous, you're so courageous. And then the second I became pet competitive, I became a threat. And you know, I, I had a few people threaten to amputate their own limbs to achieve the same advantage. <laughs> <laughs> Suddenly, they not only respected you, but they feared you. It was music to my ears, and I couldn't stop laughing. <laughs> for some people, being accused of cheating is upsetting, but for me, it was just wonderful. It was the voice of acceptance. While not much of a student in high school, this experience changed Hugh. He enrolled in a nearby state university. Now he was motivated and studied math and science. I realized that technology has the capacity to heal, to rehabilitate, and in my own case, actually extend human capability beyond what nature intended. So that set me on a mission to advance technology, not only for myself, but for everyone. After getting an undergraduate degree in physics, he was accepted into MIT for graduate studies. He got a master's in mechanical engineering and then a PhD from Harvard. Now at his MIT lab, he is revolutionizing prosthetics. We develop mathematical descriptions of how the human body works in standing, walking, and running. So we model the muscles and tendons and spinal reflexes that sent us on a technological trajectory, a mission to advance the world's first powered ankle foot prosthesis. There's so much more movement in this. Hugh is also the founder of a new startup called iWalk. Here, they are testing one of the new bionic ankles Hugh has invented. I get therapy and exercise all at the same time. John Simon is a Boston-based venture capitalist who invests in new startups. He remembers the first time he arranged a meeting between his partners and Hugh. Investors like to see the inventor connected to their product, and Hugh Herr was connected in a way they hadn't seen before. Hugh had rolled his pant legs up and was actually walking around with the technology that he was asking us to invest in. And I think that just blew people away. iWalk was funded and began producing the first bionic lower leg system called the Power Foot Biome. Prosthetist Jennifer McCarthy knew of Hugh Herr's work, and when she heard about the startup, she moved from California for the job. When you bolt the biome onto a socket and a person walks on it for the first time, they say, I feel like I have my ankle back. And no, they never say that with any other passive prosthetic device. It's they feel able again. And then the comment we get all the time is, my good side's having trouble keeping up with my prosthetic side. At some point, the prosthesis is gonna be a transportation device, like a car. And amputees will be able to walk with less energy than a person with biological legs. That's gonna happen very, very soon. Well. We'll try to be nice to them. It's, it's really sad to have biological limbs. You're just constrained by nature. Yeah. And we can upgrade. Yeah. Our, the artificial parts of our bodies are, are immortal. And now it's that time in the show where I get to say, who says I can't? You want to minimize the slack with the constraint that there's no force on me. We meet at the Gunks, the internationally known cliffs in New York State's Mohonk Preserve. Gunks is short for the Indian word Shawangunk, which is a ridge of bedrock extending from northern New Jersey to the Catskill Mountains, full of some of the favorite spots of top rock climbers like you. Our guide is Doug Ferguson. In a top rope setting, you want the rope caught on the climber at all times. Hugh puts on his running legs and runs the mile to the base of the climb. He says he's more comfortable running than walking. I'll do it on crutches myself. Hugh got to the base before me and had a few very nice words to say about what I am trying to do to the camera crew before he took me into a very dangerous situation. Yeah, I think Jothi's the right person to tell these narratives, to communicate these narratives about people that have been um, struck in life, have uh, experienced adversity and have viewed adversity not as a life-degrading process, but as a, uh, as a license to be creative, to further express yourself in life. Um, and that's what Jothi's done, and he's a, he's a fantastic person to tell these stories. Hugh's taking me straight up this cliff called High Exposure, and I can tell you, but I never told the guides. It's something I've never done before. Who says I can't? Climb away. Climb, climb on.
Jothi, you're on belay. Climb when ready. Climbing. Climb away. I'm really not sure about this part. This was extremely difficult and frankly, scary. I'm just not sure how to do this. Wonderful, good job. Then something happened that Hugh says has never happened to him in all his years of climbing. Uh, leg. One of Hugh's legs fell off. Look out, look out, run, 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 run. Unbelievably, his prosthesis was relatively unscathed in spite of the 200 foot fall bouncing down the rock wall. The guides got Hugh's leg back up on a line, he put it back on, and then went right back to climbing. Hugh blithely went on and finished the third 100-foot segment. <laughs> Having gotten up two almost vertical 100-foot segments myself, my arms, which weren't used to this, gave out, and I decided to stop there. It was an incredible experience for me, and quite a view. Then it was time to come down, rappel down that is, yet another new experience and new challenge for me. Had to find a way to rappel down with just one leg to push off the wall with. Bravo. <laughs> nice work. The ground never felt so good. I mean, you actually even looked concerned for a moment there. <laughs> it's never happened to me before. Guy Doug Ferguson had never climbed with Hugh before. To see people kind of punch through adversity like that is a pretty amazing thing. Do you hope that uh, people seeing you know, Hugh climb will inspire more people to try it? It's not as shocking to me to see him climb as it was to see you climb. I was more impressed with, with the way you did on the second pitch, which well, was, thank that's, you. that's actually in, inspiring stuff. It was an amazing day for me. I became a risk taker after I was told at age 19 I would not survive, but this was really a pretty crazy climb to do with zero experience. I still like to take on challenges. I still like to push myself. But mostly, I like the chance to highlight the amazing accomplishments of people like Hugh Her. Hugh agrees and says it's this push that is essential to recovery. The return to uh, a life that you, you imagined that you wish to live as quickly as you can is, is the best therapy one can imagine. In upcoming episodes, you will meet people equally as impressive. I believe you will be truly inspired by people who, as Winston Churchill said, never give in, never give in, never, 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 in nothing, great or small, large or petty, never give in. We want to tell the story of hundreds of impressive and inspirational people like Maureen, Kelly, and Hugh, whom we have included in episodes so far. As we make new episodes, they will come out on this YouTube channel. So please subscribe by clicking on the screen now so you don't miss any. And if you know someone, like yourself maybe, who you think should be on this show, we'd like to hear that story. Just go to www.whosaysicant.org stories and we'll take it from there. And thanks for making it possible to launch a new show like this on YouTube. Who says we can't?